my thanks to Jay Heska and Alex and the other folks uh, at YSI for putting this on and my great pleasure at being on the same panel, uh, regretfully at such long distance with Nadia and Jan. I mean, I'm, they're two of my very favorite people um, as I think they know. Um, anyway, I wanna talk about the political economy of multipolar systems because we are, in case you, haven't noticed we are sliding into we're already there actually that was a mistake the biden administration did not get um and i got a bunch of slides i'll just go quickly through them and shut up uh, basically so let me um but i i would emphasize that i'm not talking for any institution that i'm affiliated with i have learned through my life uh always to make that point clear i'll do it now uh, let's get started. Um, the outbreak, when the war started, it was a tremendous shock. But then they just piled shocks on the world. Uh, one was the way the NATO countries closed ranks. That came as a huge surprise to a lot of people. I mean, there were folks even inside Russia in the last three or four days before the war started saying this just wouldn't happen. Um, but then the thing that really shocked everybody, I think, was the Ukrainian success in beating back the Russian attacks. Now, nobody anticipated this. Uh, and this is really important to understand because there are all kinds of views floating around about how the whole thing was a setup or something. There, there are, as I'll get to in a minute, a lot of ways in which the US pushed Russia around that we will not be trying to shortchange. But, Look, nobody thought that Ukraine would uh, actually resist the Russians. I mean, for very long, you know, a week, two weeks max. Um, and the early US plans, so it goes beyond what I want to talk about here, where they were assuming when they were uh, building up in the months prior to that, that they'd have to be doing guerrilla war somewhere outside of the areas rather remote from Russia. That's not what happened. This is an absolute amazing surprise. Um, now, now we've all got this problem that Jan and uh, Nadia have each alluded to, you know, huge rises in food and energy. Um, this is on top of the COVID ones. And then we have uh, the central banks tightening right into this new tidal wave. Um, and, um, you know, the Bank of Italy comment that Nadia mentioned uh, from, I think, yesterday, it's exactly, you know, that's right. Yeah, they don't want to spend money and they do want to type. Okay. Um, but that has everybody going back and looking at theories of international relations in economics and a lot of discussion about what sensible strategy uh, to do, depending on your point of view. And so what I see, I don't really like, which is you get a revival of the realist theory of uh, international relations and the sort of distinctive feeling about realism is world politics is a battle between opposing national interests. And then, you know, now it's not, in other words, basically cooperative. The alternatives were liberal theories of IR. Those were of course, sponsored heavily by the Americans, Conan, Nye and company. Uh, in the in response to some of the realist uh, doctrines. And it's not surprising that a lot of these folks laid a lot of emphasis on how hegemony was supposed to be good for you. We'll come back to that uh, in a second. But right now, I just wanna focus on this business. And in, in the academic side of it is so-called structural realism. And it's pretty simple. It's like systems could be unipolar, one country running the show, bipolar, does that sound like the US versus Russia during the Cold War? It's because it was. And then multipolar. Now, the sort of point made by the multipolar folks is this is pretty unstable um, because a lot of the, well, I mean, like, for instance, in a bipolar system, there were even people, nobody, thank God, ever actually acted on these international relations theories, which they even claimed that if you proliferated nuclear weapons, why you'd have stability. I think nobody, in fact, actually did. Um, but uh, I want to review very quickly the general problems with the realist approach. Um, and then uh, look at the, the last case where we had the world economy and a sort of uh, 
multipolar system was probably the interwar period in the 20s. And so it is worth looking at the literature on that. The problem with that, because it's very large and it's been like the formative literature for a lot of economic and history and even seep into a lot of economics. But look, folks, um, it's not particularly good literature. Um, I mean, a couple of cautions. You will sometimes see in international relations the claim that the armaments races of the late 19th century were an aspect of multipolarity. I'd agree with that. It's a warning that there's, if you like, intensive degrees of this, but the most sensible thing to do if you're talking multipolarity is look at a really first rate cardinal case where there's not even a gold standard to hold the show together. Uh, that was what the 20s were uh, about. Um, and the other thing you want to mention in multipolarity cases is, look, the ideological views, everybody's generating them, they generate them all the time in international relations, but it becomes crazy in multipolarity periods because everybody does their own point of view on an, And so trying to get agreement on the facts becomes, I think, uniquely difficult. There's a real famous essay uh, on history and facts by E.H. Carr. It was written at the late 30s. And I, I always thought that was sort of right as multipolarity was sliding into what many realist theories have claimed is sort of inevitable war. Well, all right, let me just briefly talk about what's the problem with realist theories. Well, up to a point, they're perfectly sensible. You know, and it's obvious that a lot of power politics is completely immoral. And the point about multipolar systems being very unstable and potentially leading to war, I think is exactly right. Um, on the other hand, inside economics, even though a lot of people run around with the international relations theories, it never made too much sense. You read Kindleberger, uh, he claimed the Great Depression originated from a lack of a hegemon. You look at realist theories of international politics, and they all hate hegemons. That's what they claim they want a balance of power. This never got reconciled. Um, and the sort of current crop of realists, some of whom are very able, you know, and they're not, I mean, it's, it was ridiculous that somebody was in the U.S. was claiming that John Mearsheimer is a Russian agent. That's insane. Um, the uh, Mearsheimer has worked uh, a lot for American foreign policy elites for many years. Uh, but they, the realists tend to start out with these theories of you're either a land or a naval power and build theories about continental powers versus islands and then uh, revisionist powers in the international order. All you have to do is look at the different histories, the trajectories, if you like, of Great Britain and Japan, and you can see there's something way off uh, about the view that if you like your geography uh, is destiny, that's to be very short about it. Um, and you know, more broadly, the whole uh, realist uh, accounts of international, they just neglect domestic political economy. Um, the way you actually get sort of countries in alliance with each other is you build domestic coalitions that support that in all of them. And if they break down, the show uh, falls apart. And a point which we can't elaborate today, this big emphasis uh, on the, what happens at the level of national, really international income, the state of the economy. Boy, does that change the level of the quality, if you like, of uh, adverse, I guess I would say, interactions with uh, realist powers. Now, literature on the 20s, uh, which is the last big bet, as I said, look, there's something really obvious about this that I just never see made, which is this. It's that, you know, the fight, the, there's this large literature on central banks, finance, 20s and 30s, um, enormous lit. Uh, but the thing you want to understand is that the financial records and correspondence mostly got released before the discussions that were going on in the same countries and sometimes with those financiers about energy, Does that sound familiar, oil, in other words, they were just not declassified. And a lot of the British records stayed classified right into the 90s, and I probably I mean, going from the end of World War One may have still be held under the hundred year rule going down to you know 1922, um, say when the British and American 
clashes over oil got really hot. I know because I did find some records on that. And if you want to see the difference, and, and, and the, the other, pardon me, the other side of this is that an awful lot of folks wrote histories of the interwar period that talked about how international finance kept coordinating things. That's not, that's a half truth, just close enough to the truth to be misleading. You want to see this best place, you know, I, Marcello De Checo and I were really the people who sort of looked into archives and just said, look, this isn't true. You and Marcello did a lot more of that. We have at INET a very good series of interviews with him. They are very much worth looking at. You can just see how different it is, how different it is from most of the received history, including some people Yan mentioned uh, earlier. Um, and you know, lots of German political problems in the 30s when you look at them, and they were really key. I mean, the 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 German decisions in 1931 kicked the whole international economy down into a new level of depression, for example. That was a really big deal uh, there. Those are all coming out of uh, German domestic politics. They are not principally arising, as a lot of people used to say, because the credit Anstalt went bust. Actually, there was more gold in Germany at the end of May uh, in 31 than there was at the start of it, you know, which just shouldn't be true under that. I mean, and of course, nobody can make sense of the American New Deal as though it were just a question of national interest. They were vigorously contested, and that's generally pretty normal. Okay, so I want to just jump to now. Now, look, when Biden came into office, uh, you know, the proclamation was America's back. The administration, they were all liberal internationalists. They were nearly all getting their training from Harvard Law or someplace like that in the 90s, where the sort of liberal version of internationalism, internationalist IR, uh, was uh, exceedingly popular. In fact, that's almost the only thing you could hear. Now, I thought, and I wrote this back a year ago, that you know, it was a huge mistake uh, to go around lecturing people on the sort of basic points about uh, liberal internationalism, which is rules and norms. Because the problem in a multipolar economy is the rules and norms don't count for too much uh, there. Um, and you know, so the Biden folks lectured both the Russians and the Chinese, tended to drive them together. Um, and then when Biden made the one good decision I thought he made, where he overruled all his advisors and just pulled out of Afghanistan, that then turned into a um, disorderly mess. Um, and if, I, if I were asked, which I understand I haven't been, I guess that that's when the, the inability to do any, look, even halfway rational as you did that on the American side, probably invited folks to think, you know, these guys are a bunch of silly paper tigers. At any rate, um, in the November, the administration signed that charter on strategic partnership with the Ukraine. Now that reaffirmed, reaffirmed Ukraine's right to seek admission to NATO eventually. Robert Service, a, a very conservative Russian historian in the US made that point. Now, look, there's a history on this. I'm gonna go rapidly through it. Um, from the beginning, a lot of people in the United States wasn't uh, by any means unanimous, starting with George Kennan and Strobe Talbot, who was a major uh, advisor on Russia earlier for the US foreign policy community. They were all said, look, the move to keep expanding NATO eastward to embrace the former Warsaw Pact countries or the republics that had been in the Russian Confederation would ignite a fierce counter reaction from Russia. This is, I think, very nicely summarized in a piece Jim Kurth wrote for INET. And now we asked him to write that piece in November. This is well before the war got going because it was already plain that it could happen. Um, and I think his piece is the best single summary of this there is anywhere. Um, there were proposals all through that period from the 1990s forward. Let's Finlandize, meaning Let's not fight over all of these countries and let's might consider different policies to Russia. They were always rejected. Um, then the US started putting some missiles uh, in uh, Romania and Poland. Um, as Kurt says, that was in effect to look like we're walking back on previous uh, uh, agreement on the military status of Central Europe. Um, we all know about 2008. 
That was after President Bush proposed bringing both Georgia and the Ukraine. The Ukraine business people also know about. You had Kissinger in 2013 and 14 saying Finland dies Ukraine. That was rejected by the American government. Um, and uh, they pushed for a, uh, the Ukraine to decide between Russia and the United States. The Russians then occupied Crimea and the eastern provinces. Okay. Now, once the war got going, because I'll have to just jump ahead again, uh, you know, the sanctions shocked everybody, this we know. Um, now, uh, then the US and NATO strategy thus far has been to sort of supply arms to the Ukrainians and whatever else they needed, hoping not to go up what they talk in the nuclear uh, discussions they sometimes talk about is escalation dominance, where I mean, the problem with that stuff is you can ratchet it up, up and up, and you finally arrive at where somebody thinks they've got to drop something really big uh, in order to prevent a loss. This is the problem you always run into with real nuclear powers. Um, but so far, the, the NATO aim has clearly been to stay short of that. Although that raises a quite straightforward question about how confident are you that'll continue? Lots of people are nervous. All of this stuff, of course, has many follow on implications with China, which we don't have time to do. Anyway, you all know the basics. Nadia mentioned them. You know, the Germans did agree to sort of cut back their dependency. And it did start talking about rises in the military budget. But that led to an enormous debate everywhere especially in Germany early on. It's now shifted, exactly as Nadia said, into Italy, uh, and it's in Austria all the time, um, where uh, they said, look, the short-run costs of actually uh, cutting off all the Russian gas are just too high. We'll just be in stagflation for two or three years. Now, given the way food and fuel prices have risen, even the US officials started to temporize that, Yellen in particular, right after the IMF, because they are looking at a disaster in the developing world, a point I can't follow up on. Anyway, but the thing you really wanna pay attention to here, where I think it gets is just these last couple of slides. There's a very strong opinion in Germany that says, look, Russia isn't going away and long run relations with, uh, in the long run, relations with Russia are really important to the German economy. An unsympathetic being would say the Russians look west, but march east. Um, and it, there's the, the German government is clearly doing half measures. It's Die Welt uh, has done the best so, sort of studies on how the Schultz government has just not delivered the heavy weapons that they promised. Um, and there are a lot of folks who doubt, you know, how much natural gas, as Nadia was just saying, can actually show up in Germany or Europe or any place else. Now, interestingly, that view is exactly held inside the American oil uh, patch, too. They are openly saying it if you uh, look hard um, there. And so uh, there's talk about, you know, a European Union buying authority for uh, gas. Um, they actually have it, but it doesn't, it's not clear to me what's going to actually happen there. Anyway, where this comes through uh, is that you can see as the costs of all this melt, the domestic skepticism in Europe, also in the United States, is surfacing. In the U.S., you got a whole gang of right-wing billionaires. It's a mistake to think that's all you have, but there are a lot of them. Um, and generally, Republican-oriented groups are breaking with the Democrats in the last two weeks, and suddenly dissent in Congress has widened. Uh, the Koch brothers are often brought up in some of these discussions. We'll leave that stuff for another time. Um, then the um, same problem in Europe. You can see, like, the, a lot of folks see the question as, is this 1938 or 1914? The 1914 fear is simply you end up with a world war, a really big one. Uh, the 1938 story is, what happens if uh, you don't block a Russian invasion? After all, invading a country is a very heavy step. And of course, invading a country in Europe or on the border of, I'm not gonna get into that dispute, that shocked a lot of folks. 
Um, you, you don't need to be a genius to figure out that the sort of what we might call the frontline countries, maybe less hungry, are in other words, Poland, uh, Lithuania, Estonia. So they all certainly are nervous as cats that it's 1938. Um, now, uh, where this gets pretty interesting is that the Biden administration really pivoted on its Green New Deal story. Uh, which it, it had, it, it never, it rejected that label, but then actually tried to do some serious climate change. I mean, even, even I had to admit it was a pretty good, decent job as they aspired to, it didn't happen. They had real trouble in, in the US Congress and many other places there. Um, but the, uh, you now have oil companies operating with the parts of the Democratic Party and certainly with strong relations into the White House and they're all enthusiastic about selling liquid natural gas to the Europeans. Usually the route envision goes to Spain and then from Spain elsewhere, though that lots of steps uh, there that would have to be fixed. Um, and you can see this in the democratic primaries, by the way. Now the problem this poses, uh, let's just set aside the war question for a second, is if you're gonna build up a liquid natural gas network, it's going to be incredibly expensive and it's going to require years for the investment to pay off. Now, what had actually been happening until then is modest pressures with not too much success to get countries everywhere to lower their reliance on fossil fuels. Um, now, while some Greens also have tried to use this crisis to push for faster renewables, you got a kind of renewable versus, if you like, traditional fossil fuel race. Um, and about the issues here are much bigger than usually raised in public. They are raised in memoranda and discussions. I've seen them, uh, but I just, a lot of conservative greens, there are many such, who have been dreaming for ages of how can we fix the famous German mercantile trade surplus? And could we transform Germany into a modern digitally based information age productive structure? Now, what happens to manufacturing in that? I, I do want to insist, countries do try to get rid of their manufacturing in our experience. I remember a discussion with the best known of all of the Japanese finance ministers back 20 years ago. And he absolutely shocked me when he said, we got to get manufacturing out of Japan. He said, it's pretty much like I'm just talking to you now. We need to throw that off into the developing world. Folks do like, some, some people are enthusiastic and they tend, I think, to overlook all the problems of an informa so-called information age economy. It has sweeping implications for unionization and for the future of social democracy. Folks are kind of asleep at the switch on this. So what's the prognosis? I think it's pretty easy, actually. The longer the war drags on, the more complete the European energy break with Russia is likely to end up. Um, that will lead to a much closer integration of Europe and the US, partly through NATO, because they're all gonna, they are gonna increase their defense expenditures. Now I've spent almost my whole life um, since it started, you know, when I came of age in Vietnam, skeptical about military expansion. I'm not telling you this is all wonderful, okay? I'm saying it, this is a serious problem and one has to deal with it. Um, but there's a considerable amount of planning that it gets involved, transnational planning to just do single weapons. Nobody can make really profitable big weapon systems that don't have substantial sales outside the country. So you will, and economies of scale are big in this stuff. And lots of folks are aware of it. So that the drive on scale economies uh, is gonna be big. On that point, I will just thank you for your attention. I'll stop. I'll get out of this stop share.